I can't say enough good things about Kindred Bravely. Their clothes are functional, stylish, and so luxuriously comfortable. You may not want to wear anything else. And since they have pretty much whatever you may need, whether it's one of their many hand-free pumping and nursing bras or tanks, soft and breathable bamboo pajama sets, bump supportive swimwear, award-winning leggings with pockets, nursing-friendly dresses and jumpsuits, soft labor and delivery gowns, and oh so much more. If you wanted to wear nothing but Kindred Bravely, you could. In fact, I can't get enough of their Louisa maternity and postpartum support leggings. They are my favorites. Find your own Kindred Bravely favorite today. Visit kindredbravely.com and use the discount code BIRTHFUL20 to save 20% on your purchase. Save 20% on your purchase when you use the discount code BIRTHFUL20 at kindredbravely.com. Mighty Pregnant One, heads up. In honor of Father and Father Figures Day, we are having a flash sale of my Ultimate Birth Partners Labor Support Toolkit. This means that until Sunday, June 26, you can grab a copy at 20% off using the code GOTYOURBACK at birthful.com slash toolkit. Now, this toolkit brings together my tried and true favorite and most effective ways of supporting a laboring person so that your birth partner can feel confident and comfortable as they support you through labor. And the best part is that it's packaged in a condensed and super easy to absorb manner that provides clear and straightforward guidance. It also includes an audio version as well as questions to ask your nurse, a list of essentials to pack in your birth bag, labor position cheat sheets, and a bunch of other goodies. Learn more at birthful.com slash toolkit and use the code GOTYOURBACK for 20% off. Welcome to Birthful Mighty Parent or Parent-to-Be. I'm Adriana Lozada, and as we continue into our nutrition and nourishment series, today I am going to be talking with Tony de Aztlan smith about her birth stories that happened seven years apart. Now, Here at Birthful, we usually try to focus on positive birth stories, but sometimes to get to the positive, birth journeys may start out rocky, difficult, and be even traumatic. If you listen to our Models and Places of Birth series, which I truly hope you did, you know that as a culture, we give birth in an imperfect system that has, in many cases, lost its way from truly supporting and elevating the person giving birth. In some cases, it has become abusive. And if you are preparing for birth, you need to understand what you may be getting yourself into, even though it might not be the greatest thing to hear. However, naming it is the first step to changing it. Now, the good news is that you do have choices. You are powerful. So once you determine what kind of experience you'd like to have and how you'd like to feel, please, please, please be proactive. Line up the team and place of birth that will best support you through your experience. Make the team as large as it needs to be to help get you into the best place mentally, emotionally, physically, so that you can show up at your birth the way that you want to. I know that there are plenty of things you can't control during birth and that there are no guarantees, but no one should have to experience trauma when welcoming their child, and being proactive can make a difference. A key part of being proactive is making sure you nourish your body, your mind, and your spirit so that you are well-resourced for what's to come. So back to Tony and her birth stories. Tony says she went into her first birth without doing much research and naively trusting the system, which then resulted in an eye-opening traumatic experience that took over six years for her to process. For her second birth, she knew she wasn't going to go through that again. So during the pregnancy, she was incredibly proactive in making sure she stacked the deck in her favor. Health-wise, Tony had three goals. The first one was to be negative for a group B strep. Then the second one was to not develop gestational diabetes. And the third was to avoid preeclampsia. She says that thanks to the changes in her nutrition and lifestyle, her proactivity paid off and then some. You're listening to Birthful, here to inform your intuition. Welcome, Tony. I'm so glad to be talking with you today. 
Oh, me too. Thanks, Adriana. Before we jump right into the stories, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, my name's Tony. I'm married. We currently live in the Midwest, um, but we used to live in Arizona, and that's where I gave birth. I have a four-month-old today and also a seven-year-old daughter's. Hey, happy four months. Yeah, yay. She slept five hours straight last night. Congratulations. What a good gift. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> oh, awesome. So let's take you back to when you were first pregnant. What were your feelings around birth and what were you doing to prepare for what was coming? So I was pretty naive about birth. I knew close to zero, just what you see in the movies. I had a very healthy pregnancy. So much so, I kind of ignored my pregnancy and focused on work more than anything. I was still traveling up to my eighth month. I worked up to my due date, and I had no issues with the pregnancy at all. Yeah, so what care had you set up? What facility were you giving birth at? I was living in New York City, and I found an OB. You know, I liked her. I didn't know what the experience should be. So, you know, I had my regular checkups. They were 10 or 15 minutes. I went to my regular ultrasounds and there was nothing in depth or comprehensive. It was just, do you have any questions? I would say no. And I would come back and check in again the next time. Mm -hmm. As usual. And then they just get closer, those checks from every month to every two weeks to every week. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And I never Googled anything. I mean, like I said, I was focused on work. I kind of just thought, I put all my trust in my OB and I just figured, hey, I'm going to a hospital. If anyone knows how to do this, it's going to be them. You know, this is how it's done. And so then how did it all begin? So uh, I went over my due date and my OB is like, well, let's schedule an induction. I said, sure, you know, of course. She scheduled it for at a hospital that she would be on call at or that she was working a shift at. Actually, I'm sorry. And so I said, perfect. You shall be there anyway, right? I walked into the hospital just completely naive. I don't even think we brought um, a proper bag. I had my purse and uh, I thought, you know, I'd go in, get my induction, get out. And that's not what happened. So did she explain the induction process to you at all or what was going to happen? Yes. In superficial terms, she told me how it went. You know, she said, we will do a Foley bulb induction. And then if it progresses, we will give you medicine to move it forward. And I guess when you're hearing those terms for the first time and those instructions for the first time, it doesn't really, there's no explanation about how it's going to affect you or how to prepare for it. You know, it was, this is what's going to happen in the end. I'm going to link on the show notes, an episode on the induction process that I have with also Tony, Tony Golem, <laughs> different Tony, because there's a lot more to it than, as you were saying, than just, mm -hmm. this is a fully bulb and the medicine and then it's going to work. Yep, exactly. Yeah. So I went in and they started, you know, like I said, Foley bulb, they broke my waters and added the Pitocin. And I basically experienced what I now know as the cascade of interventions and up to a point where my baby was in distress and they were telling me that I would have a C-section. On top of that, though, I was also uh, in a facility in my hospital where I was getting really poor treatment. I was getting abusive almost treatment, no informed consent, procedures were being done on me, vaginal checks were being done on me, and nobody was talking to me, nobody acknowledged me. I was forced to uh, labor on my back. So all these different things that at the time I thought this must be what the hospital's like, but it was just worse and worse treatment that added to the stress of labor. At any point were you questioning this and saying, hey, no, I don't want to do that? When you were trying to advocate for yourself, what was the reaction? I mean, no, I mean, barely. I would say we didn't know how to advocate for my husband was there with me. We didn't know how to advocate for me. Um, I know when I would bring up certain things, I didn't know how to, how to speak what I was feeling. And I was in such pain that I was just reacting. And I know that the nurses would get upset with me. For instance, they tried to put an oxygen mask on my head And that really freaked me out while I was laboring. So I was wiggling and writhing quite a bit. And I was told that, you know, women get tied down to beds if they don't sit still, which was very threatening. And so we kind of were frozen in that moment for hours, my husband and I just getting 
this treatment and not knowing how to stop it. And that is so just so inhuman and horrible because it isn't like I, I, I am so sorry you had that abusive treatment and and that they were very condescending and not not telling you what was being done, doing things without consent, but also telling you lies like this sort of veiled threat of women get tied down if they don't do a certain thing. Not anymore. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Maybe during twilight sleep in the 20s. Yes, um, exactly. <laughs> but no, yeah, I'm so sorry. I know. That's it, it, I that's why I want to share my story. I mean, it's awful, but I I fear I mean, I thought the same thing. I thought what what decade are we in? And I just want to make sure other women know that it shouldn't be that way. Mhm. So from that the induction was happening. Things were moving along. They break your water. Pitocin brought on some really strong contractions. Mm -hmm. And as you're saying that it was really painful. Did you go for an epidural? What were your options? What what happened? Yeah, I was laboring really well using um, sitting up, meditating. And then once the, the contractions got jagged, it actually was once they put the oxygen mask on me and they made me lay down and not labor in different positions. I couldn't handle them anymore. And I did ask for the epidural, but I was at that point so overwrought. My body was exhausted that I can remember I was like a rag doll and they couldn't even get me to sign the consent form. So someone actually put a pen in my hand and moved my arm around to do kind of a signature for the epidural because I, I just couldn't move. I was so floppy with exhaustion. Oh, wow. And, and and this wasn't your husband moving your hand. It was somebody from the staff? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And so then you did get the epidural? Yes, I got the epidural. And then so soon after there was a heart rate drop for my daughter, I guess she was distressed. And they said, if it doesn't improve in an hour, that I would be taken in for a C-section. And I think that actually was the point for me where I felt that I lost complete trust in the hospital and in the medical people that were helping me. I said, if I got to do this myself, my gosh, these people are not going to help me. And so I started breathing, doing very deep breathing and meditation and visualization. I had my husband put his hand on my belly and talk kindly to the baby. And I, we, we breathed together like that until they came and check, I guess an hour. And I just was watching that monitor to get the heart rate up, you know, and we did it. And they said, well, the heart rate's up, no C-section. But honestly, that was the point where I was like, we got we to gotta do this and we got to get out of this hospital. And what a big, like, uh, horrible circumstances. But having that aha moment. Um, yes. So how yeah. powerful for you, though? Did, you, did it feel powerful? It for felt you? powerful. Absolutely felt powerful. I, I knew that I had to draw in from the power of the universe to get this. And and I don't want to disparage anyone who gets a C-section, but I had lost so much trust at that point that I feared for my life if I went into the operating room with them. Do you remember at this point how long it had been since you went into the hospital? At that point, I, I don't know. Another thing is nobody was giving me any information. Nobody would talk directly to me except to kind of tell me to be quiet and things like that. I didn't know how many centimeters dilated I was. I didn't know how many hours have passed to at certain thresholds. But I know that the total time we're in the hospital was 14 hours. I mean, with, with the whole time to delivery was 14 hours. Okay. So they weren't even telling you how dilated you were? No. No, they weren't talking to me. That's outrageous. I'm so mm -hmm. I'm so sorry. Like I am I am flabbergasted because that it just seems so out of norm. Yeah, and it was it was out of norm. I want to just add that it was out of norm. I can explain that later. What yeah. I mean by that? Yeah, let's tell me. Okay, let's yeah, let's continue the story in terms of you took charge. They were watching. They came back an hour later. Her heartbeat was stable. Things were good. What happened next? I don't know how much time had passed, but I was ready to push. I didn't know it. They told me uh, that you're ready to push because I couldn't feel anything from the epidural. I couldn't feel anything to push. So they had to turn it off. Um, I pushed not very long. I want to say 15 minutes, not very long at all. I do remember they were shouting at me to push and I couldn't, I didn't understand how to push. Like I didn't understand what I should be pushing 
in my bottom half, uh, what muscles to use. I, I, I was very confused. That's how naive I was. And so uh, she was born from the distress. Of course, she had the meconium. Uh, they whisked her away. I mean, they cleaned her up. Um, I got no skin to skin. And they detected uh, she had a fever and I had a small fever. So they took her to the NICU. And nobody told you why she was going away? No, they told me she had a fever. And then that was the reason why she had to go away? Yes. Okay. Um, and I'm guessing they were suspecting infection if both of you had a fever. Yes. Yeah. When did you get to see your daughter again? Not until the next day, I believe, that I was able to go in and try to nurse her. So what happened during those 24 hours or that that time between when she was born and you got to see her? She, you know, I feel like horrible because I don't know a lot of what happened. I know she was given a dose of antibiotics. She was fed um, formula. Uh, nobody asked me what my preferences were regarding that at all. And I was in my room, you know, recovering and filling out paperwork, basically. And this was all done without... Just as a matter of fact, nobody asked you what you wanted to do. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I didn't even know I had the option. So when do you went to see her at 24? Or I keep saying 24. The next day when you went yeah. to see her, um, she was at the NICU. She was still mm -hmm. at the NICU. So you went to see her. And what did they say? They said she's a healthy baby and she does not need to be in the NICU. It was, uh, they released her. And of course, it takes time to discharge. But. That was it. That was all we were told, you know. Okay. I want to get a little bit more information of what you were saying about this hospital that you did found out later that this wasn't norm and why. So what led to me finding out about this hospital was that after the birth, I suffered, I developed anxiety. I mean, severe anxiety for years. I became a toxic mess. And I struggled as a mother. I struggled in my career. I struggled in my marriage. Finally, a, a friend of mine suggested a therapist, her therapist, and just recommended treatment. And I reluctantly went. And during that therapy, the, during therapy, a couple of months in, I got diagnosed with PTSD from medical trauma. And my therapist informed me that the hospital that I birthed in was actually part of a series of hospitals in Brooklyn that had the highest maternal mortality rate in the country. And these hospitals were treating uh, women of color in particular poorly and mothers were dying in them and they were getting shut down. And my hospital was shut down. So I, I know you sent me a link to the um, ProPublica did a review or a story on this and this increase that in general in the U.S., the maternity mortality rates and harm for baby are also dismal outcomes, right? But specifically even higher for women of color. Yes. With your chances of dying if you're a woman of color are two and three times higher. And in some little centers, it can be even higher than that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm guessing in your hospital, it was higher than that. And we'll link on the show notes to the expose that ProPublica did. So once you found that out, did that make a difference? How how did you feel after that? It made a total difference. I had been blaming myself the whole time and blaming my husband. And I realized it wasn't our fault. We were in a systematic abusive situation and we weren't guided by anybody or given any proper care. And it relieved me that with my therapy um, helped me start on a healing journey. And that's when I decided to have another baby. Long had it been since when, between the birth of your first baby and when you decided to start therapy and have the this sort of healing realization that got you to a place where you wanted to have another baby? Almost six years. That is a lot to process, Tony. I know. It's been a long journey. Yeah. So... Walk me through a little bit of you were deciding six years later, you're deciding to have another baby. What are you doing differently for this birth? So I s decided that this birth was going to be in my hands and I was going to do it my way. And I wasn't sure what that meant at that moment, but um, I got pregnant right away. 
And I had established care at this amazing birthing center in Flagstaff, Arizona. They had preconception counseling and I went for that. And um, it was my first interaction with a midwife. And it just changed my mind about what childbirth could be. I had no idea that it could be something that empowers you. I thought it was a painful uh, experience that no woman wants to endure but has to to have a baby. And I just did a 180 on my attitude after talking with the midwife. And I began what I call my proactive pregnancy journey. (laughs) And just the fact that they were having preconception counseling, like that that right there, I wish everybody would. I mean, it's never too late. It's one of those things that the information is power. And the more you know, if it's the day before your birth that you're finding things out, then that'll be helpful than not finding out. But if you can start informing yourself before becoming pregnant, that that's even so much more powerful because nine months is really not that long. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And this birthing center, it had a, it was basically a wellness center for women. They had a lot of different classes attached to it. And when you become a client there, you get to do all these different types of classes and pursue them should you wish throughout your pregnancy. And I mean, I did everything I could. I should say that I was at an advanced maternal age. I was 40 years old and being Latina so there were risk factors involved, but I, I wanted an out-of-hospital birth. So I said, okay, I know I have to make sure that I am in shape enough that I can do this, you know, and I am not giving myself the option of an epidural by doing the birth here. So what can I do to get ready? And um, I just have a long list of things that I did for the pregnancy. <laughs> Name me some. So I changed my diet completely after taking a nutrition class, including drinking two to four liters of water a day, Uh, hired a doula, of course, seeing a birth therapist. I switched from my regular therapist to uh, someone who specializes in processing birth trauma and creating a, a birth plan. I did Bradley childbirth classes. I had acupuncture. I had chiropractic care, pelvic floor therapy, spinning babies. I did cardio walking and prenatal yoga every day. I had prenatal massage. I had a perineum massage. I had uh, I used coconut oil application daily, read every book I could get my hands on, meditation, supplements and raspberry leaf tea, squats. I mastered squats <laughs> and watching birth videos and listening to podcasts like yours. I mean, I, I, I was, it, was, it became my second job. I see this. And that is so intentional of especially understanding that it's a whole mind body process, it seems. And you were taking care of your mind through your birth therapist. And I'm sure like having the midwives and the care they were giving you and with your doula and the Bradley classes, and then also taking care of your body with the acupuncture and the chiropractic and walking and the massage and the parent and the meditation. Like you did all the tools, but they're all so beneficial. Absolutely. The only thing I couldn't fit in my schedule was hypnobirthing. And I kind of wish I had done that. Should have pushed myself on that one. Well, I think you were doing quite a bit. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. As the time passed and and you were getting closer to delivery, how were you feeling doing all these things? Was that building up your confidence? Were you feeling more excited? How was your anxiety? My anxiety virtually disappeared. I felt confident. I was building, what I didn't realize until the end was I was building a support group. And uh, I didn't have that the first time around, but I, uh, at every aspect from my mental health to my spiritual health to my physical health, I had women that I could count on for this birth. And I knew that if I wanted to avoid the hospital, I kind of had these three major tests I had to pass, or or I, I shouldn't say test to pass, but my fears were preeclampsia, gestational diabetes, because I'm Latina and I was overweight, and testing GBS positive. And I, I kind of made those my like goalposts throughout the journey with this proactive pregnancy. Did you avoid all three? I avoided all three. And I tested GBS positive with my first and was negative with my second. And I did not want an IV. I, I wanted as minimal interventions as possible. Awesome. So what do you think maybe made 
that specifically that so I I know that for the preeclampsia and the gestational diabetes, you said you changed your diet completely. Do you think that also helped with the GBS result, or were you doing anything else specifically to address that? I think the diet helped tremendously. I was also doing other things. I started taking garlic shots, so raw garlic with lemon, just drinking that down once a day. And uh, with all my supplements and, and my diet, I think that really helped. I get it. By the end of the day, the last decision you want to worry about is what's for dinner. So how about you let Home Chef bring simple, delicious meals right to your door? Home Chef has 20 different chef-curated meal options every week, and you can even customize meals by swapping out types of protein or going for vegetarian-friendly options. And if your schedule gets hectic, Home Chef also has extra quick solutions like their 15-minute recipes, microwave meals, and oven-ready options. Of the recipes we tried, the tilapia coated with tempura mix was truly one of the best fish fry I've ever had. And the roasted broccoli with honey mustard dressing had my daughter asking for more. And she doesn't even like broccoli. For a limited time only, go to homechef.com slash birthfall for 16 free meals. Again, go to homechef.com slash birthfall for 16 free meals. So then the day is getting closer. You're feeling more confident, more empowered. They test you for GBS and it's negative. You're not developing preeclampsia or gestational diabetes. So then what happened? How did it all start? So I went over my due date and that was a trigger for me because I knew that if I hit a certain amount of weeks, interventions would begin. So at 41 weeks, they'd probably do a membrane sweep. I would start getting NSTs at daily. So I was doing everything possible to naturally induce. At 40 weeks and five days, I woke up with more than Braxton Hicks. I guess that's the way to explain it because I had been having Braxton Hicks. And that morning I woke up and I go, oh, these feel a little different, right? And I remember we woke up every day after after the 39th week, me and my husband would say, today would be a good day to have the baby. And I remember we woke up and I said, today would be a good day to have a baby. Let's do it. So um, I sat and felt the Braxton Hicks C type contractions get a little stronger in pressure. And I told my husband to take my older daughter and to go hang out somewhere else because I wanted to basically have early labor alone. I just wanted to be in peace. I I can't explain it. I just wanted to be able to feel my body and make sure I knew what was happening. So I sat and watched Netflix and snacked for a couple of hours, texted my doula team. And then at about 3 p.m., so that was about 8 a.m. to 3 p.m., I no longer could eat. I basically lost my appetite. And my doula texted, are you timing the contractions? Because they were getting stronger. And I said, oops, no. (laughs) My husband came home and he started timing the contractions. And they were getting closer and more intense, of course. Which is what you want. Yeah, exactly. Which is what I wanted. And I was so at peace with it. Every time a contraction came, I would just say, here's one. So then my husband knew to mark. I would start doing very deep belly breathing. I would brace my arms and just allow myself to kind of go not limp, but soft. I didn't want to tense up against the contractions. And they progressed and they started getting more ouchy. (laughs) The pressure was getting a little more painful. And my husband suggested I labor in the shower. And so I went in the shower and, oh, that was wonderful. So that was probably an hour into what I felt was the progress. So maybe 4 p.m. Okay. I was in the shower. It felt great. I had several contractions in there where I was bracing myself, telling myself to stay calm again, softening my, my, my jaw. I think that's what I was trying to soften that I read in a book and just getting through breathing through each contraction. My husband called the midwife and she was like, Oh yeah, you know, we'll be there in about 45 minutes or so. And he's like, no, I think we need sooner. And I think I'm not sure, but I think because our voices, his voice was so calm. We were so calm that they kind of didn't think it was immediate, but things were progressing really fast. And so he was like, no, we'll be there soon. And my doula came over 
And uh, I started getting more intense, more intense pressure waves, just one painful one, one painful one, and then one incredibly painful one, right? I was on my knees on my bedroom. I had my arms braced against the edge of the bed. And I just, at the top of each contraction, I literally told myself, stay calm, breathe. And I took in big, deep belly breaths, braced my arms and just breathed through each contraction. And I love how you're describing what we call the labor rhythm or your ritual. I'm sorry. So the ritual is what we see that usually each person develops their own ritual at their own, but it's whatever is going to get you through the contractions and you get into this sort of dance of here it comes and this is what I'm going to do and this is what is my coping mechanism and how I'm going to get through it and then it's over and then we'll do it again and do it again. And you kind of keep doing that until it doesn't work and then you vary it to create something new. But I really appreciate you explaining that because I find that everybody kind of does their own and it's not something to worry about. Like if you don't develop it, then people around you tend to help you something will come around, like even your husband saying, get into the shower and give that a try. Yeah, no, those suggestions. So things are getting more intense. You are definitely working fantastic with your sensations. And you were saying you were having this wave of like a smaller wave, a smaller wave, a big wave. Yes. Yeah, which is also a super common thing to happen in, in labor the first two are like preparation. And then that third one is when bigger change happens in the uterus. Yes. And, and the, the bigger ones was in my head telling myself, don't panic because it would be so painful. But, um, and it was my preparation. Honestly, I remember listening to your interview with Guapio where you discussed this. I read books where they talked about this in mindful birthing and in Ina May's books and my Bradley childbirth classes with my doula. So I had, you know, I had so much preparation for it that nothing was surprising me in labor, even though I hadn't gone through that process before, really, you know. So um, my doula showed up. She was doing the counter back pressure, the lower back, which was great. My husband was getting packed up to go to the birthing center. He was also minding my seven-year-old who was in the other room, in her bedroom, playing the whole time. And my doula, she suggested, why don't you go labor on the toilet? Because that was something I had said I wanted to try. I've heard such good things about it. And I went in, I went straight into the bathroom and I sat on the, the lid of the toilet and uh, lounged on it, basically. It felt so good to labor <laughs> on it. Um, I kind of was, I guess, I was bracing my my perineum on the on the top of the toilet lid, I guess, is the, and kind of just rubbing through the contractions. I don't know if that makes sense. I, I liken it to like when a dog rubs themselves a, across a carpet. You know what I mean? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I was, I mean, I don't know if that's too much information, but that's what I was doing and it felt really good. Well, um, and I find I, nothing's too much information if it, <laughs> like, because this is, Birth is its own thing. So whatever works for you is great. But giving yourself the permission to mm-hmm. even, you know, move however on, on this way that you wouldn't necessarily normally do because we don't necessarily like rub our butts like dogs. On the <laughs> yes. <laughs> but if that was working and it was feeling good, then yes, absolutely. I know. I know. It's terrible to say, but it really did feel good. So I just want to let other moms have that permission to do that, too. And I guess I was moaning quite a bit and my doula could tell, you know, that I was getting close. So she knocked on the door. Let's go to the birthing center. And they got me into the car and it was about a 10 minute ride to the birthing center. And this is where I think my story is a little different from a lot of other birth stories I've heard because I loved my car ride. It was so soothing. I had the the window down, air was hitting my face. I had one hand on the dashboard, one holding that bar over the window and I was doing the the leg rub thing against the seat and I was just swaying, like sw- hard swaying through each contraction and still telling myself to stay calm and breathe. And there were like washes of color behind my eyes that were just soothing me. So the, the air, the washes of color. At one point, I felt like I was on an airplane or a train, just like flying, traveling. And when we got to the birth center, I was kind of like, oh, we're here already. Like, I kind of wanted just to drive as long as I could. (laughs) Uh, You were deep in your labor land. 
I was deep in labor land. I think so. Yeah, and those hormones were doing great work. Oh, mm -hmm. so good. And you too, of course, not just the hormones. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> no, of course not. And so um, uh, one of the midwives and the nurse met me in the parking lot. And I remember I hesitated to get out of the car, of course, because I was so happy in it. And she just said, do you want to get in the tub? And I was just like, yes. And I just got up and shot up. And they helped me across the parking lot. I, you know, I had, I think, two contractions through the parking lot. So you can tell I was really getting really close. They were getting on top of each other, the contractions. Um, once we were in the birthing center, things got a little chaotic. And I think it's because I was so close. And they don't usually have moms come in that close to um, delivery. But I went straight to the toilet because that was the place in my head that was the most comforting. And the nurse had to kind of get me out <laughs> and because, and I kept saying, Oh, I need to, I need to poop. <laughs> I kept saying that, you know, I was saying that and they were trying to get the heart rate using the Doppler, the hand Doppler. And I guess the heart rate was uh, a little low. So the nurse tried to put an oxygen mask on me, but my eyes were closed and I didn't know it was coming and it triggered a, a response where I just shook my head and kind of batted at her like like a little kid just I didn't know I was, but I was really fighting her off you should and, see my face right now when you said that she was coming at you with an oxygen mask yeah, I yeah. Really went, oh no well this is where you should smile because thank god for doulas my doula who knew my birth plan where that was trigger was mentioned grabbed it and said I'll just hold it and she just held it in front of my face not touching my face and that, and my anxiety dropped back down. I was back in labor land. Like she prevented me from totally losing it in that moment. Mm -hmm. It was, it was incredible. So um, the tub, I guess, filled up. Oh, I was on the bed. They had me on the bed. And I, one of the interventions I wanted to avoid was vaginal checks. So in my head, I think I was scared that they were going to, you know, open my legs up and give me a check. So I kept my legs, my knees together, and I kind of was rolling back and forth in the bed <laughs> just because I didn't want to give anyone an opportunity, I guess. It was very um, instinctual. So I think the midwife kind of got that I wasn't going to let her check me. <laughs> no one said anything. It wasn't spoken. Um, but, she, but somebody said, oh, the tub is full. Do you want to get in? And I, again, jumped up and just went for it. Like I went from writhing in pain to up going and got myself right in the tub. And um, the second that I can remember walking into the tub, they call it liquid ep epidural. And mm -hmm. that's what it felt like. It felt like as the warm water inched up my legs to my waist, it was just this incredible comforting feeling. I just felt so good. It was, it was amazing. Mm -hmm. um, so I got in the tub. I was in a squat position on my knees. So not really a squat, but, but my bottom half was kind of open, I guess, in, in the way I had learned to squat. And I was holding onto the side rails. And I kept saying the whole time I was telling them I need to, I need to poop. <laughs> so um, the midwife was finally said, Hey, you know, just uh, bear down if you feel it again, bear down. And I could feel it coming on. And one thing I, I think I was confused about at that moment is it it was so much pressure between like my perine in my perineum area, that I thought that it was going to I, could, I was confused about where the baby was going to come out of at one point because the, I didn't realize that the pressure would be so strong uh, closer to my butt and not so much in my vaginal area. And and I said, oh, my gosh, you know, I don't think I can do this because I thought the baby was it, – it's very irrational, really, because we all know where they're going to come out of. But for a moment, I was not sure where the baby was going to come out of because of the pressure. So, of course, she went down, uh, and that's just her going down the birth canal – and I bear down one, two, three, and then I could feel her head coming out. And then there was a couple of breaths and pauses and I did another push and I just felt her whole body slide out of me. I could feel it as if it was my hands touching her going out of me. I could feel the contours of her body. It was amazing. And the midwife caught her and she handed her up to me and my husband was on the other side of the tub. My seven-year-old was right behind him. They were looking at me and I held my baby and I just had a shot of that oxytocin high. I just started laughing. I was just giddy. And my husband said that I look like 
on a game show, the sweepstakes winners, how the exaggerated, excited face they make when they win the prize. He said, I look just like that. Like I just won the best prize. And I had my daughter on my chest there in the tub. And I just said, I did it. I can't believe I did it. Mm -hmm. You did. Oh, that's <laughs> such a lovely story. <laughs> All that preparation, you brought it all together because I think when when we allow ourselves to be that present in this in intense situation and really connecting with the body and are undisturbed, mm -hmm. right? Because you were in that tub alone, like nobody was mm -hmm. trying to touch your perineum around that time or focus nope. on her head or very much directing your pushing or it was just you going deep and connecting with it. Then you get to do these things like feel the outlines of her body coming out of you. Absolutely. And no ring of fire. Mm. It was amazing. That is amazing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and yeah. every experience is so different, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, but it can be. So I, I think that's what I, gives me the most passion is knowing the possibilities yes, of what absolutely. it can be. Absolutely. Yeah. So I guess I should finish up. I got out of the tub to birth the placenta and at the birth center, they have a nice big wide bed. And so my seven year old got to sit next to me uh, while I had skin to skin with the baby and she got to ask questions. She watched the placenta get birth and it was amazing. I, I just felt so proud that my daughter could be there to see the experience. And she has now a baseline understanding of what giving birth can be. And I, I was just really grateful that the midwives allowed us so much time. We kept the cord going until it drained. We were given another hour after the golden hour for my husband to hold her before they started checking the baby. It was it was incredible. And what a gift to your daughter to be able to witness this type of birth. Yeah, absolutely. And her babysitter came right after that to pick her up and take her to dinner. But I just thought... I. I'm so glad that the babysitter couldn't make it earlier because that gave my daughter the opportunity to be there. And I should say that from the time we arrived at the birth center to when the baby came out, it was 27 minutes. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It almost took longer to tell it than this is like a real life play by play. <laughs> yes, it was that fast. So I, so for those that are worried about my seven year old hanging out for hours, she was not. She was, she was just playing with some toys and then suddenly she was watching me give birth. <laughs> what does she say about the experience? Well, I mean, to her right now, as a child, she sees blood and blood means bad, but she has a understanding of what a hospital birth is and what it, I don't like saying natural, but, you know, unmedicated physiological birth is. She, she basically knows like there's differences and she knows also that um, the treatment that you get, that it, it should be a situation where there's kindness and comfort and people are supporting you. And I think that that's a good baseline. We can talk more about it when she's a teenager and as she grows to be a woman. But I think that's a good baseline. Yeah. And she'll always have that memory. Yes. Is there anything before we wrap up that you wanted to make sure we get to that we haven't mentioned? I guess I would just say that having, putting in all that effort and taking all that time and focus on my pregnancy so that I could have the birth that I wanted, is it's not just a vanity thing. I think for a while I got, I got worried that it was something that I want to do just for myself, but it's, it was so empowering that it's helped me in my, as a mother, it's made me a much more gentle mother. And this time around with the infancy, everything feels more intentional. I'm more mindful and, and even and with my seven year old. And so I just think if more women, more mothers had this knowledge and could be as purposeful and proactive in their pregnancies and births, I think it would create a ripple effect in how we raise our children. So I, I'm just so glad that I got my second chance. Oh, absolutely. It's not a vanity thing. It's you, like you're saying, you, you parent better when you have a better birth experience. And if we think back to your how you met your first daughter and how that started and all the anxiety and mental state where you were at at that point, 
it's yeah. so hard to, with all of that going on inside you, also be mindfully parenting. Yes, exactly. So, yeah, it is huge. Absolutely. Thank you for saying that because I'm 100% in agreement with you. <laughs> <laughs> How is your husband feeling about all this? Well, he hasn't outright said it. It's come out in snippets, but I am... We think that he suffered some post-traumatic stress from the first birth also. And this was a really healing journey for him too. He went to every single appointment with the midwives. He was at all the childbirth classes with me. Well, Bradley Method requires a partner. He did all the research with me. He read the birth partner, which to help me get through labor. He was 100% my partner in this. And it, it, I should say it's not just the parenting. Our relationship is better because of it. We're such a good team. Oh, and that's awesome that he also decided to go in for that full transformation after having the first experience. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one thing we learned is that, you know, you need the oxytocin for everything to get everything going, the birth, the breastfeeding. And I, I just see him as, you know, my source of oxytocin. I mean, it's just, it, it emphasizes the need for love. Mm. How has this postpartum experience gone? We didn't talk about if you breastfed your first daughter and how that experience worked, but how is it going now? So I am, I'm also being very proactive in my postpartum. So I made sure I had support. I had all the products I would need for my body. I had friends come visit, make sure we had the, you know, the meals, my mom, I have a therapist who focuses on postpartum depression. I'm reading some books. I do postpartum Pilates and um, going to postpartum group. Whether or not you feel like you have postpartum depression, I think going to a group, having somewhere a touchstone, you know, once a month or once a week to talk to other moms, I think is really important to prevent, you know, feelings of isolation. Hugely so. Because postpartum, it's weird. It's such a unique characteristic of you're can be so isolating. And at the same time, you're never alone. Yes. <laughs> but yeah, having that connection with some adults that are going through the same experience. Yeah, hugely important. Yeah. And I and I think that I still struggled. You know, having a newborn is hard. And the sleep de- deprivation is hard. The breastfeeding is going really well. So with my first it was very difficult to start. I think we, we missed that window where the baby can get the breast milk started with the cluster feeding. We didn't have that. And we right, struggled. You, you didn't get to even initiate breastfeeding until like the next day. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And she had already been fed formula at that point. And they were giving her these big two ounce formula bottles with the, with the big nipples. So she was chugging formula basically. And then she would, she really had no interest in trying to get the breasts going. So that was a struggle. So I, we mostly did formula and I did my best to breastfeed, but it it was really, she was mostly formula fed with this baby. I got to start right off. I felt the whole second day cluster feed, which was wow. Very painful, not the nipples, but you know, the breast milk coming in and, um, and the no sleep for, you know, almost two days. And now I mostly breastfeed her. She's supplemented mostly because I needed a break to sleep. And so I don't pump. The pumping is a trigger for me from my first, when I was struggling so hard, um, I was always on my pump and it became a, a trigger for me. So I don't pump the noise of the machine more. So, um, she has mostly breastfed with supplementing with formula Mm -hmm. so that, so mom can sleep. And I think I wanted to say something about that is that I think there's so much pressure on moms that it becomes a trigger point for anxiety in postpartum. And I had that, like you have to breastfeed. And I just want to say that you get your choice about, about one or the other and everything in between. And that's what I did. I I told my midwife, I told my birth therapist, I don't want that anxiety. So I'm going to go be okay with whatever I can do. I'm going to try and I'm going to do my best, but like the pump, I don't want to do. So I'm not going to do it. Well, and it has to be sustainable. 
whatever mm-hmm. you're doing. And if it's draining you, I and I can understand, I can understand really wanting to do it and trying to do all the things to do it. And, you know, some people struggle for months and then finally it clicks. And I can also understand having circumstances that create a situation that makes it so much harder to come back from. Yes. Which means you kind of have to readjust expectations and not guilt yourself into I didn't do this. And I think it's really healthy to have clear boundaries, like you're saying, of I will do this, but I can't do the pump. Yeah. And how are how can I make it work? How what what is gonna work for me? Absolutely. And I think like childbirth, breastfeeding is another topic that we don't get informed about during our life. So it kind of comes on suddenly and there's not a lot of spectrum given at I, I see a little bit more with lactation consultants, but I know with my daughter, it was breastfeed or nothing kind of sentiment, my first daughter. And that's hard. It's so hard to suddenly get hit with this expectation, not having any information beforehand. And usually the expectation with breastfeeding is, oh, it's just going to work. <laughs> mm-hmm. And there is so much to it. So much. Yeah. I mean, if you were just a primal being that, was with your child 24 hours a day and we're not giving birth in a, like if we went full on physiology, uh, biology on it, yeah, it would work because you would do things very differently. Yes, exactly. Our whole culture and lifestyle would have to change for that. Yeah. I will say one thing I did in my pregnancy that I think helped with breastfeeding. I would um, put coconut oil on my breasts every day um, during my pregnancy And in my breastfeeding, I have not had any like cracking or nipple pain. And I don't know if it helped, but that's something that I did to prepare for breastfeeding. And I think it's one of those things that might help can't hurt, you know, in terms of your skin. Like that's just nourishing your skin. But if baby doesn't have a good latch, there's no coconut oil that's going to avoid blisters. You know what I mean? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yes. And I was lucky that I had a great lactation consultant who's also part of the birthing center and she showed me to watch for the signs of a bad latch. And so I kind of was able to work with the baby to get her to open nice and wide and, and get a good latch. Awesome. Well, congratulations, right, on oh, on all your preparation paying off and having such a healing, having the healing yeah. birth that you wanted, that you worked so hard for. And thank you for wanting to share it. Oh, thank you so much for letting me share it. That was Assistant Professor of Practice in Digital Media Production and Mother of Two, Tony Dastlan Smith. You can find Tony on Twitter at T Dastlan. And you can connect with us on Instagram at Birthful Podcast. In fact, if you're not driving, we would really just love it if you would take a screenshot of this episode right now and post it to Instagram sharing your biggest takeaway from this episode. Make sure to tag at Birthful Podcast so we can see it and amplify it. You can find the in-depth show notes and transcript of this episode at birthful.com, where you can also learn more about my birth and postpartum preparation classes and download your free postpartum preparation plan. Birthful is created and produced by me, Adriana Lozada, with production assistance from Asia Plati. Thank you so very much for listening to and sharing Birthful. Be sure to follow us on Good Pods, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, and everywhere you listen. And come back for more ways to inform your intuition.